I think most of you are here. I'm sure more people will join us, but it is so good to be with all of you at Rossmore today, even if only virtually. I can't wait until I can come again in person and um, play bocce ball or have cocktails at Creekside. It's Friday afternoon, so I'm thinking about cocktails at Creekside. But um, it is wonderful to be with you here today. And we have a great group of people to help provide information to you about what is going on in the community. And I hope everyone is staying safe and dry. The storm seems to have mostly passed, although it's supposed to come back. So hopefully that wasn't too much of a hassle, but we're supposed to be staying home. So I guess that helps. So we have a lot to cover today, but first I want to introduce who's going to be with us. Dr. Ori Svielli from the Contra Costa Health Services. He's here to talk about what is happening at the county level to ensure you're all getting um, tested and vaccinated and the like. Uh, Tim O'Keefe, the CEO of the Rossmore Golden Rain Foundation, will give us some updates on Rossmore. And Vice Mayor Matt Francois, the Walnut Creek liaison to Rossmore, is here as well. I'm going to start with Tim O'Keefe, who has an exciting announcement about vaccinations. I know that's what most of us are thinking about these days. So, Tim, let me turn it over to you. So thank you, assembly member. We are thrilled to finally announce that we've got a vaccine vaccination clinic set up for the Rossmore community starting next week. So let me just to briefly describe what that clinic means and, and who's eligible. So right now it's set up for non-Kaiser members only uh, and uh, John Muir health plan is going to be conducting the, uh, the clinic and it's for people over the age of 75. So that's that's how it's gonna be set up initially. And uh, I really wanna acknowledge the county and their really tremendous support in helping make this happen. The, um, just some quick details about it. It's gonna start Monday from nine to five and it will run till at least February 16th. And again, it's only for non-Kaiser members over the age of 75. Appointments are required. There's not going to be any kind of a walk-in. The um, first couple of days, so Monday and Tuesday of next week, John Muir will contact a small number of their patients to set up a, a, a small group of, of uh, vaccinations for Monday and Tuesday. On Tuesday morning, they're going to provide us with the registration link and phone number that we'll make available to the Rossmore community. And we'll publicize that on the Rossmore.com website on channel 28 and on Nixle. So make sure you're signed up for those. And then also it, it, we will post the information on our Rossmore information telephone service. And you can get that by dialing 988-7878. And we all wanna remind people that this is only for Rossmore residents. It's not available for people who live outside of Rossmore. And uh, so please don't share this information with your friends or family members that live outside the community. You're gonna be required to provide your medical identification when you come in for your vaccination. You're also gonna to need to show a government ID, like a driver's license or a state ID card. You'll also need to show proof of residency inside Rossmore, and that can be your Golden Rain Foundation ID card, or it could be a copy of utility bill and it's got to show your name and your address. And then uh, we'd ask that you show up about 15 minutes early. Um, the shot's going to be in your upper arm. You'll be observed after the shot for about 30 minutes, up to 30 minutes. Uh, and then the second shots, you'll make your appointment for the second shot uh, while you're there getting your first shot. And that's going to, the second shot will occur after February 22nd. And then for, for Kaiser members, Kaiser's planning to set up a clinic at Rossmore starting on February 17th. So um, stay tuned, we'll provide further information as the vaccines are available to, for Kaiser members. The providers have asked us to communicate to everybody in Rossmore that if you already have an appointment for a vaccine outside of Rossmore, do not cancel that appointment. I know it's uh, heard stories, people not very happy about traveling to San Pablo or Martinez or Antioch, but the vaccines that they've made available for the Rossmore community already takes into consideration the number of appointments that Rossmore residents have already made outside of this area. So uh, we don't want, you, it's not gonna help you to have two vaccines of the, of the first shot it's only helpful for you to have one. So if you already have an appointment, continue with that appointment, don't cancel it. 
because we've already the county has already made an allocation to the Rushmore community based on the vaccines that are available and have already been given out. Uh, the other question we had an earlier town hall today, and, and this was important for people to understand also, is that if you've already gotten your first shot outside of Rossmore, do not get your second shot inside of Rossmore. Go back to your provider. You will have already had an appointment for your second shot if you've already gotten a first one, and you'll get your second shot from that provider outside of Rossmore. So do not expect that if you got a, a first shot, say up in Martinez, that you're gonna get your second shot in Rossmore. It can't happen that way. So I wanna make sure people understand that. And um, also uh, this again is only for people between the ages or over the age of 75. The state and the county have both identified that at different clinics, they, they're taking people as young as 65. Uh, but that is not the clinic that we're operating. The Kaiser and John Muir are only able to do 75 and above, at least at this time. And once that whole population in Rossmore is vaccinated, then they'll evaluate in terms of the availability of the vaccine and decide whether or not they can um, move on to other age groups. So we, we would just ask that everybody be patient. They're all, uh, John Muir is only gonna be able to vaccinate about 200 people a day. And um, it's going to take two to three weeks or so to get through the first shot with that population. Um, so it, it's going to take a while. Just be patient. We'll, they'll, in, they'll ensure that everybody that is over the age of 75 will eventually be vaccinated here in Rossmore. And uh, I think with that, that's, that's our big announcement. So thank you for letting me share it with the community. Please. Thank you, Tim. I know that um, both Senator Glazer and I have been working hard um, making sure that that coordination is happening. And I'm so grateful to you, the Golden Rain Foundation, to the county and to the healthcare providers for bringing that to Rossmore. It's obviously a community that we wanna make sure gets the vaccination and is protected. So um, it's great news. I will add that I did speak to Kaiser this morning and they did say that obviously their um, shots in Rossmore are delayed, but if you want to try to seek a shot and you are a Kaiser patient before the vaccination clinic is coming to Rossmore, you can call the local Kaiser if you're over 75 and get an appointment at Kaiser Walnut Creek. So that is also an option. You do not have to wait if you are over 75 until Kaiser comes to you, but you can, it's an option, but I wanted to make sure people also understood that. As Tim mentioned, this is an option to get vaccinated this way, but it's not the only option. Um, so it is such good news that we are finally vaccinating our population and especially um, our seniors who are most vulnerable. So thank you, Tim, for all your work on that. So this week we had a change. The health orders changed a little bit. Oh, I did wanna add one thing, which I was remiss in mentioning at the beginning. If you want closed captioning, Zoom now has closed captioning. So you can go down to the bottom of the screen and you'll see something that says live transcript. That'll show you closed captioning. You can adjust the size of that font as well and it'll show it to you while we're doing this. So just a note if that's helpful. So uh, as you may have read, we're now back in the purple tier and the state stay at home order is no longer in effect, which means outdoor dining and some personal services have reopened. Um, our numbers are encouraging as someone who watches our, our daily dashboard um, and has been watching those numbers. We have gone down significantly in the last week and a half um, and that's great news. Um, just today, we're down to 8% community spread from well over um, that in the weeks prior. So we're trending in the right direction. I will say we are not there yet. Um, and so I do want to encourage everyone that, you know, continue to be socially distant, wear your mask now. The CDC is recommending double masking. Um, I know some people were doing that already, but an easy thing to consider. And, um, you know, those are important things for us to continue to do. And especially even after you get the vaccine, I know that we have little data about the effect of the vaccine on your ability to spread it. So um, we appreciate you doing that so we can continue to get those numbers down and, and save lives in our community. So now I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Zdielli to answer some of the questions that I know are burning in our minds. And what is those trends we've been seeing? Can you talk a little bit about them and what's happening? Why our numbers are going down the way they are? Sure. So, yeah, I think this week uh, marked the one year anniversary since the COVID pandemic began in our country. So uh, I know that because we operate in operational periods that last a week and we this was number 53. So um, it, it was a stark reminder of what a crazy year it's been, how hard it's been for so many of us, how isolating. Um, and the numbers really in, in December and January were the 
some of the hardest numbers we've had in terms of numbers of cases and deaths and so forth. Uh, right now, we are seeing uh, a positive trend, as uh, Assembly Member Barghan said. We are seeing the case numbers slowly going down, and they have been for about two or three weeks now. Our hospitalizations are also going down. We are uh, down to, let's say, I just pulled up the dashboard, uh, 189 people with COVID in the hospital um, as of today. And about uh, three weeks ago, we were at 100 more than that. We were at 289, so significantly better. Also, our test positivity rate is going down. We we were at 11% at the peak. I think I just saw the, the last good number as of a week ago was about 7.6%. And it's looking like it's continuing to go down. It will probably end up in the sixes for today. Um, and uh, so, so a lot of really positive trends. Why are the numbers going down? Um, we think it's a combination of things, but the, the biggest one is we think that stay at home order worked. We think people are being more careful. They're masking more, they're distancing more. They're, they're not um, being cavalier. I think they've seen, uh, you know, we've had over 530 people die in our county. I think people are seeing that it's, this pandemic is real and taking precautions. And, and we're gonna need to keep doing that even after we're vaccinated because even though the vaccine is amazing and uh, very effective, and we can talk about that more in a bit, we, we, it's not 100% effective. And so, and we still don't know how well it reduces transmission. It stands to reason that it will reduce it significantly, but that hasn't been proven yet. What we know so far is that it stops people from getting sick, but not about transmission. So we will need to continue to mask, to socially isolate, to, um, to wash our hands and um, just be smart about not gathering indoors when we don't have to. And uh, we all keep doing that until we all don't have to. Uh, so we're in it together, basically. Yeah, thank you. I mean, it's so important to highlight how difficult this year has been, how isolating, how many lives we have lost in the county. Um, and um, I'm grateful for every life we have saved as well through the distancing that we've done, the masking we've wearing, but it's too many lives lost. So let's continue to do our part. Um, so thank you, Dr. Svealy, for talking about that. But it's nice to have a little hope to see those numbers going down and knowing that we're getting vaccinated. And you and I were just talking about the milestone that we hit on vaccination today. We passed 10% of the county vaccinated, which was a really exciting milestone for me to see. Um, it feels real. People are actually being vaccinated. Um, so can you talk a little bit about vaccine distribution and administration? Um, how many sites do we have? How is it going? Sure. Yeah, I'm. I'm happy to say that I think we're up to about 115,000 people vaccinated so far in our county. Over 10% have gotten uh, the first dose of vaccine. People that we want to vaccinate. So the over age group is the top age group. Uh, almost 30,000 people in that age group have been vaccinated. Um, the um, the sites that we have, we have a lot of sites. Um, the Contra Costa County um, clinic, Hospital and Clinics have a bunch of sites at West County Health Center in Martinez and in Pittsburgh. Uh, they're looking at adding more in the coming weeks. And then the Public Health Department has opened several sites. We have one at uh, the Richmond Auditorium, one at Contra Costa College, one at DVC, another at the Nick Rodriguez Community Center. Um, we just worked in partnership with the state. We were actually the first place in the state to add a state testing site with a, a, a contractor named OmServe that does a lot of testing. So they're gonna now do a COVID vaccination site. And that's at the Tice Valley Auditorium right outside of Rossmore there as well. And they're also vaccinating people over the ages of 75 right now. We also are distributing vaccine to a lot of Safeways and Rite Aids all over the county. So if you sign up at the county website and express interest in vaccine, you may be given an appointment at one of those sites or at one of the county sites that I've mentioned. And then John Muir this week began vaccinating at both the Walnut Creek 
and the conquered locations. We're allocating a lot of vaccine to them. And Kaiser is also vaccinating and Walnut Creek and Antioch, as well as in the Richmond facility. So a lot, we've, we've decided to distribute the vaccine to a lot of sites to try to bring the vaccine to where the community is. I think we've had really good results with that. We are uh, we have the best rate in the Bay Area for vaccination per 100,000 uh, of all the large counties. So I'm proud of our team for doing that. Yeah, no, I've been um, very impressed with the, um, the ability to vaccinate. And I know just today the county was telling me that um, you're, you could double, if you had the supply of vaccine, you could double distribution overnight. You're set up to do it. We just need more vaccines coming in. Yes. Is that right? Yeah, yeah. We, we're set up to do over, um, right now, over 30,000 uh, doses per week. And we're getting about 18,000 from the state. So we could, uh, we could do more. Um, the, as much as we can get, we'll, we'll move it uh, as quickly as we can. Um, that's been a strength. We don't want to sit on vaccine. We want to get it into arms. Uh, right now, we, it, we in our county have about 77,000 people over the age of 75. And uh, so far, we vaccinated uh, just shy of half of those, about 30,000. So we still have a few more weeks to go, but we expect that uh, maybe in two or three weeks, we'll be ready to go down to the next group, which would be between 65 and 74. That's, and that's a question we got from quite a few people. I know there was a lot of confusion when the state announced that we were going to start vaccinating, um, not just 75 and over, but 65 and over. Um, and 65 year olds are eligible to go sign up on the county website. But as I understand, they are not currently getting appointments you are prioritizing yeah. 75 plus set, is that right? Yeah, that was confusing. Um, and for a while we were taking interest forms, right now we are not taking interest forms for, for that age group, but soon we will open that up again when, when we're ready, when we feel like we've gotten through the, the group that's 75 and over. We have really good data that shows us that the older a person is, the more risky it is for them to get COVID, the more likely they are to get serious illness or, or die. So we really wanna to get to that group first and then get to the next group and sort of go in order. That makes the most sense um, the way we're rolling it out in our county. And, uh, but we're, we're really close to that. I think, I mean, if you look at our numbers, we're averaging more than uh, 5,000 vaccinations a day, and the vast majority of them are now in that age group because Kaiser is doing over 75, John Muir is doing over 75, OptumServe, and the county. All of us are doing the same, using the same criteria. So I think we'll be able to, to move down uh, relatively uh, quickly in two to three weeks. That's good news. I hadn't heard that. So that's Cutting edge news, everybody, that we expect to get through the 75 plus population in two to three weeks. That's awesome. So thank you for that. Um, and I know uh, somebody just put into the chat a question about um, getting contacted when um, those folks who are 65 to 75 are eligible to sign up again. And I know, um, you know, my office did send out an email the first time when people were eligible to sign up and we'll do it again. Um, you know, we get that information and we wanna make sure that everybody has it. Um, with the link, there's also now a call, a number that we'll be sending you um, if you need to call and you're not able to sign up online. The county has um, wonderfully set up a call center for those folks for whom that is the easier way to sign up. So thank you for that. And so let's talk about additional vaccines. I know people are wondering when um, maybe the Johnson & Johnson vaccine is coming, especially since it's only one dose. Do you have any sense of what we're looking at on the horizon for more vaccine supply? Yeah, there, there's three vaccines from large companies that are making their way through the, the trial uh, data and submitting them. Uh, none have been approved in the US yet other than the uh, Pfizer and the Moderna vaccines. The one we heard about this morning was Johnson's and Johnson's. Um, it's a, a single dose vaccine. Um, the advantage of that vaccine is it is refrigerated and can stay in the fridge for up to three months. So it makes it a little easier to distribute. Um, it, was a, it was about 85% effective with that one dose. Um, and I know they are also doing a trial of a booster dose. So a two dose regimen for that vaccine. Um, the second dose being about two months later uh, to see if they can boost that efficacy from 
85% to a higher number. But 85 is still really good for a vaccine. If I if I was offered the Johnson Johnson vaccine, knowing what I know today, I would get it. That said, they have not yet submitted for uh, for the FDA approval. I think they will in the in coming couple of weeks, and then we don't expect to see that sort of in our fridges for another probably six to eight weeks because they have to ramp up their manufacturing capacity. But we're looking forward to having. Uh, that option as well. There's also the Novavax and the AstraZeneca vaccines. Um, those are still in study phase. Um, and we're, we're looking forward to having as many options as possible so we can vaccinate the whole community. Once we have enough vaccine, we're also thinking we'll do some of those mass vaccination drive-through events as well. So we're, we're making plans for that, but just don't have enough vaccine to do that yet. Yeah, you seem to be doing well. I understand from the county that um, you are not holding on to vaccine for more than five days. It is in arms within five days of you receiving it, which means right. you're using it effectively. So thank you for that. Um, do you, one question following up on what you just said, I think I'd heard there's evolving thinking about how effective the Moderna and Pfizer vaccines are after the first dose. Do you know anything about that? Well, um, I'm not sure if this is what you're talking about. I think there's there's a question uh, in England, they decided to delay the second dose. They're still doing two doses, but they are delaying the second dose because they, they believe by looking at the data, which is more limited, that uh, one dose is, gives you pretty good results, you know? Um, so I think they've considered that in the United States, but they don't feel like there's enough data to really make that switch. So for now, we're sticking with the with the original schedule, which is Pfizer uh, three weeks later, Moderna four days, four weeks later. I think the other thing that's been coming up in the press is there's all of these new uh, variants or strains of the virus. Um, there's one from South Africa, one from England, one from Brazil that have really been in the news. And I think, um, the, the question is how effective are the vaccines against those strains? And I know all the manufacturers are studying those questions. Um, so far, it looks pretty good. I think the strain from South Africa is the one that it's looking a little more iffy on. And uh, they are um, working, they're all working on booster shots that will cover more of those strains. I don't know if we'll need those, but it would not surprise me if a year from now, we were all recommended to take a booster that would cover more of these other emerging strains. I think it's too early to know that yet. And luckily we don't have a lot of um, that South African strain in the US yet. There's also some novel strains that have been discovered in the United States, in the Bay Area even, and in Ohio. and. Um, and we're all waiting to see, are they more contagious? Do they make people sicker? That is actively being studied and we don't know the answer on those yet. Okay, well, thank you for that. Um, I know we got a question about what will be different when Blue Cross takes over vaccine distribution. From your end, hopefully nothing. <laughs> I'm talking not, um, I'm not talking Dr. Savelli, Spielli. I'm talking to the folks at Rossmore. That is back in distribution. So that is really meant to be how our providers get the shots, but you should be receiving it um, hopefully in the same way that it is set up now. That's the vision. Do I have that right, Dr. Spielli? Uh, let's hope so. We're still in the dark. We're waiting to hear. It's actually Blue Shield, not Blue Cross, but yes, Sorry. we're waiting to hear um, exactly how that will affect distribution and allocation of vaccine. We, we feel like um, we're, we've set up a lot of sites and we hope they all still get their allocation so we can keep people vaccinating. We know that a lot of, a lot of our partners, including Kaiser, John Muir, they all vaccinate more if they got more vaccines. So the, the goal is to keep the vaccine flowing. We hope that Blue Shield does a good job of that when they take over from the state in that process. Yeah, one of the things I know that I'm advocating for is for counties like Contra Costa, where clearly, you know, vaccine distribution here on the ground is working very well, is that hopefully that moves the, sh the doses faster from the state to the county, but that we don't mess with what is happening at the county because it's working. <laughs> so let's not mess so with too. it's working. <laughs> <laughs> um, the state does that sometimes. So again, from Dr. Spiele and we know promises, but we're both trying to make sure that's the case. <laughs> 
Um, one question that we got that I think is really important is for that small window of time when you were taking interest forms from those folks that were 65 to 75, if they did sign up and they got that email acknowledgement, they don't need to sign up again, do they? They don't. And we are trying to send out an email uh, once a week, at least sometimes twice a week saying, we got you, don't worry, you're still in the queue. And when we do go down to that lower age group, we will um, send you a ticket to get your actual vaccination appointment. Okay. Um, so one question that we got was, does the vaccine reduce chances of getting COVID or just reduce the severity of the symptoms? Do you actually contract it or not? That's a great question. Um, it, it, uh, it does reduce the chance of both. Uh, it reduces the chance of contracting COVID. And if you get it, you are much less likely to um, need to go to the hospital or get a serious case of it. So it's, it's effective for both of those. Okay, great. So you talked a little bit about the new strains that um, I know for me are um, it's frightening the new strains are coming and that um, it may need, we need booster shots. Um, I was happy to learn that it will be just that, that we're not starting back at the beginning of creating the vaccine process, but um, what should we do to keep ourselves safe as these new variants are moving through our community? I think do what you've been doing, you know, be, be cautious about gathering masks, um, take take good care to stay distant from folks when you can physically distant and uh, wash your hands a lot and just pay attention to the news. We still don't know about a lot of these. They're all really scary, right? Like new strains, new variant, what's gonna happen? But um, coronavirus has something like 250 strains already. And most of them are just another strain. It doesn't make it worse. Um, doesn't make it more contagious. So there's a lot to be learned still. And I think what we're getting better at is doing surveillance monitoring to see what strains are actually circulating out there. Um, I know for our, us at the county, we're now sending a percentage of all the tests we get to the state for genomic sequencing to see what strains are here. And so um, that's getting better. I think we'll, we as a public health entity nationwide and statewide and locally are, are getting some of those processes down so we'll know what's circulating locally and whether people should be extra cautious or not. Thank you, Dr. Sviali. Okay, I'm gonna turn it over to the vice mayor, but if you don't mind staying on the line, I know we're gonna have more questions for you as we get to the end. Um, so thank you, Dr. Sviali, for all of the information and all the work you do to keep our community safe and healthy. Um, we so appreciate you. So next, I want to turn it over to Matt Francois, the vice mayor of Walnut Creek and your Ross Moore liaison to provide a quick update on what's going on in Walnut Creek. Vice Mayor. Thank you very much, Assembly Member. Thank you for hosting this town hall and also for your efforts in getting vaccination sites up and running in Ross Moore. That's greatly appreciated. Uh, Dr. Savelli, well, first of all, let me introduce myself. My name is Matt Francois. I have the uh, pleasure of serving as the mayor pro tem this year and also as the liaison to the Rossmore community. So I'm working hard with Mayor Kevin Wilk and we're uh, getting things up and running and look forward to a productive year. Uh, Dr. Savelli mentioned the vaccination site that the state is operating out of Tice Valley Gym, which is a city facility. We're very happy and that we're able, the city is able to help in making that city facility available as a state vaccination site. And just to give you a flavor, our city staff is working at lightning speed. I think we got a call on a Friday from the state saying they would like to use Tice Valley Gym as a vaccination site. And by Monday, it was up and running. So we're, we're although we're, we don't have primary response, responsibility over health issues in the county, we absolutely want to be a good partner and do whatever we can uh, to help deal with this public health crisis. Um, in terms of the council and what's going on, we are in the process of looking at our council priorities. We had last adopted those priorities back in 2019, and those priorities were economic development, environmental sustainability, fiscal sustainability, and infrastructure and facilities. We will be having an update on those priorities at our February 16th meeting, and then a council retreat on March 23rd 
to set forth the priorities for the upcoming two years. I suspect we'll be focusing on a lot of these same issues and probably also trying to tackle uh, racial and social justice issues. Quickly, we had a, a restaurant grant program that was unanimously approved by the city council at our January meeting. And that makes available grants of $5,000 to $10,000, depending on the type of restaurant. That's money that essentially these restaurants, these critical businesses can use at this time. And it's it's sorely needed. The These poor operators had just gone through the process of, of constructing uh, outdoor dining structures and then the stay at home order came in place. So now uh, thankfully that that's been lifted and we can provide a little fiscal relief, we're happy to do that. And finally, just on a public safety note, I wanted to let the community know that the city is in the process of recruiting for a new police chief. Our former police chief, Tom Chaplin, retired in October. And so we're well in the process of doing that, seeking community input and looking forward to having a new chief on board uh, perhaps in the next two months. Thank you, Vice Mayor. And I wanna thank you for everything the council has done to support the local small businesses in Walnut Creek from the creativity to make changing the way Walnut Creek driving has worked so that they can, they can be outside when that's the only option for operating and the grants you've done. And it's so critical right now. So thank you so much for your partnership on that. We really appreciate it. Um, one thing I wanted to touch on today while I was here because it came up in our last town hall and I know it's something a lot of people at Rossmore are thinking about I was at the farmers market recently and it came up was is the fire um, evacuation plan uh, for Rossmore and my office has been in touch with the local agencies and con fires uh, protection has uh, they, and they've had planning meetings with Dennis Bell representing Rossmore and with the Walnut Creek Police Department. And since law enforcement will be responsible for executing the plan, it's critical that we have fire and law enforcement working together on the plan. There is a comprehensive evacuation plan that involves the appropriate law enforcement partners as well as the Rossmore representative. And if you have any questions, um, the deputy city manager for Walnut Creek, Carla Hansen, has the information regarding that plan and my office can give you more information about that but we are on top of it and ensuring that as we head towards our next fire season that that evacuation plan is in place for Rossmore. We know it's a concern and we want to make sure that if something were to happen um, we have a way to get you all out safely. So I want to provide you with that update shortly and then give you a little bit of an update about what's happening in Sacramento before we go on to answer questions many of which will be for Dr. Svielli about the vaccines and other health uh, concerns. So, um, and while, and just so you know, when we get to Q&A, you can put those in the chat or put them in the Q&A function, and we will try to get to as many of them as possible, although likely not all of them. It's nice to have so many of you here today. So just a little bit about what's happening. As many of you know, last year we had to cut $54 billion from our budget as a result of the COVID pandemic deficit that was created. Um, and we were hopeful that we would get some aid from the federal government that would um, stop some of those cuts, but that wasn't, that didn't come in the fall and we did have to make those trigger cuts. But the good news is that not only do we have a new administration who hopefully will provide aid to the state, to the cities, you've heard um, all the good work that our cities are doing and they need aid from us as well. Uh, but we are showing much better projections than we had anticipated, although we still show about a $5 billion deficit, but much better than the 50 $4 billion deficit from last year. And that leads us with a lot of opportunity to help right now, which is very exciting. The governor put forth his proposed budget in January. Uh, I was very pleased with many of the things in his proposed budget. It was a very education forward budget, which I was very happy to see as a um, a legislator who cares very deeply about our children and their education in California, uh, but also a lot of focus on the pandemic, on vaccine distribution, on ensuring that we're doing what California needs us to do right now to get us through this pandemic and to recovery. Um, as you can probably tell from my conversation with Dr. Svielli, my office and I have been working constantly with Contra Costa Health Department to make sure that we have accurate information, that we're supporting them in every way possible to ensure that they have the testing resources they need, they're able to do the contact tracing that we need to keep this pandemic under control, and to do the vaccine distribution as quickly and efficiently as possible. 
Um, we've also engaged with our local businesses. You heard from Dr. Svielli that we're lucky to have partners like Rite Aid and Safeway and Walgreens who are vaccinating folks in the community. And so ensuring they were able to get the approvals they needed at the state to be able to be points of contact here in our community. There's a lot of money in the budget um, focused on the health disparities we're seeing, ensuring everyone has adequate health care, and that's really critical. Um, making sure that we look at equity and how those who've been disproportionately impacted can get the support they need. So looking at direct payments to Californians to help them. Just yesterday, we also were able to successfully, with bipartisan support, extend our eviction moratorium to ensure that renters in California who can't pay their rent right now because they're out of a job are protected through the end of June. Um, it's a, it was a great compromise that not only helps our renters, but also helps our small landlords get the relief they need. Because we know if those um, small landlords are foreclosed on, the renters are out of a home anyways. So we were able to use the over $2 billion we've gotten from the federal government to provide that critical relief to both our landlords and our tenants. And hopefully that helps people stay in, our, in their homes. We're continue to be laser focused on our housing and homelessness crisis here in California. We do not want it to get worse during this pandemic. We want to make sure it gets better. And we've been able to do some of that work through Project Home Key and Project Room Key, uh, which have provided rooms and homes for those that were out on our streets during this pandemic. But many of those will be um, transitioned coming out of the pandemic into permanent supportive housing to get people off the streets and get them the services they need, while also funding the wraparound services that individuals need to get them to a better place and into permanent housing. Um, as you heard from the vice mayor, small businesses are top of mind for all of us. We know this time has been incredibly difficult for our small business owners as they've had to close and open and create different ways of doing business. I've been inspired by the entrepreneurship we've seen and their creativity, their ability to do as much as they can, but they also need our help. And so we are looking at significant relief for our small businesses, both with tax relief for rehires, as well as, um, funding for our small businesses in the form of grants similar to what you heard is happening locally. Uh, so we continue to look at how we can support our small businesses and, and recover with a growing and booming economy like we had before. Education, as I mentioned, was really a top of mind for all of us. I work tirelessly to try to get our children back to school. As most of you know, I have three young children of my own, a first grader, a third grader, and a fifth grader who are learning and going to school right here in my house. So I know firsthand what our students are going through. They've been out of school almost a year now. And we really need to get our kids back into the classroom, both for their mental health and social well-being, but also to ensure that we don't have massive learning loss from this time that they have been on Zoom instead of in the classroom. So we're looking at funding for schools, $2 billion to ensure that schools have the resources to reopen and get our kids back in the classroom as soon as possible. Uh, the law allows for our kids to get back in with proper precautions once the uh, we are down to about 25 cases per 100,000 in the county. Here in Contra Costa, we just got down to 31 in 100,000 today. So we're getting there. And I'm hopeful that we'll be able to get some of our kids back in the classroom relatively soon with the state support um, again, looking at how we can prevent wildfire. I know we talked a little bit about your wildfire plan, but ensuring that we are providing resources to do wildfire prevention. Wildfire is obviously critical, both from a um, safety perspective, ensuring that our communities are safe, but also a climate change perspective. It is a huge source of emissions and we have to be on top of preventing it and stopping those fires as soon as possible to keep our communities safe and prevent those emissions. So there's significant money in the budget looking at how to do prescribed burns, um, fuel breaks, and ensuring that uh, the fire service has the helicopters and tools they need to fight fires as quickly as possible. Excitingly, there's also money in the budget for technology for early detection of fires, something that actually was um, first used here in our own community and looking at how we can take that statewide to ensure that if a fire breaks out in open space, we know before it gets too close to our communities. Um, so that's a little bit about where our priorities are from a budget perspective, always important as the state that we're supporting our values and our budget is a statement of our values. And right now that means supporting each of you and our small businesses and getting us to a place of healthy recovery and safe communities. Um, 
we are also going to be introducing legislation to support these matters. I've got two bills looking at utility caused wildfires, ensuring we're holding our utilities accountable to ensure that they are doing the prevention work they need to do. Also ensuring that if they are here doing work that might cause a fire that our fire services know so they can be prepared in case of an accident. Uh, we're working on environmental legislation, always laser focused on climate change. It's not gonna stop because of the pandemic and we need to be doing what we can. So I've got a bill coming on clean energy, another coming on clean air. And so continuing to work on those matters even right now. We're also doing a couple of bills focused on gender equity. It's come top of mind right now because during the pandemic, the workforce has been decimated, but women have taken the brunt of that more than anybody. And so ensuring that we continue to look towards a future of gender equity, despite the steps backwards that we have taken during this pandemic. Um, we also had the opportunity to work with Contra Costa County and Walnut Creek and other partners on a very exciting measure that we supported. We voted on Measure X, which provided the half cent sales tax to go to mental health services. And we're gonna partner with the county on putting forward a statewide system that will create a phone number for mental health services outside of the 911 system. So a separate number somebody can call if they need mental health services. You shouldn't have to go through the criminal justice system if you're suffering from a mental health crisis. We want to get you mental health help. And so that is an exciting partnership with the county that I'm bringing forward this year and hope we will see in the near future. So with all of that, that is what we're working on. But I just want to let you all know that we're here, we're working hard, and we are always able to help if you need us. We've been working, my incredible staff, many of whom are here, um, are working tirelessly from home on helping people get their unemployment checks. I know we got a question about unemployment fraud um, and it's, let me touch on it because it's really important. The question was focused on what we are doing to look at the fraud of billions of dollars to the state and federal um, dollars that have come into the state by incarcerated individuals and others through the EDD. And I was just on a call last week with CDCR focused on this exact question. How could this possibly be happening? Uh, we are, one of what we found is that there is no data sharing allowed between the, the unemployment department and the prisons. And so there's no way to cross check and make sure we're not giving money to those individuals that are incarcerated. So we have a law that, we, that I'm co-authoring that will change that. We will be able to check the records against the prison system and that will hopefully just end that whole um, cabal. But it's important that we look at the question of fraud because we want those dollars to get to the people that need it most. And we are working hard to ensure that tax dollars are spent wisely and not being um, sent to fraud to those that are committing fraud. Um, but we are here to help if one does need unemployment. So if you need, you know anyone who needs our assistance, please call. We wanna help and do as much as we can. We can also help with the DMV. I know it's a hard time for that and we've been able to assist folks with DMV services as well. So please call my office if we can be of assistance to you in any way. Um, but now I'm going to turn to your questions. Um, quite a few of them. So I don't know if we'll get to all of them, but we, like I said, we will do our best to get to as many of them. Um, so here's a question for Dr. Savielli, if you don't mind popping back on with me. So Sandra L says, how will seniors know when their appointments come up? She's an active member of the Rossmore community who helps seniors with no internet access and limited phone access and is concerned that one may have submitted that form and now it's their opportunity to get an appointment and they won't know about it. So what should they do? Um, the um, form had on it an email address and the turn comes up, the email should be going uh, with your uh, appointment ticket should be going to that email address. If you are helping someone who isn't necessarily on email or isn't keeping up with it or worried that it might have gone to their spam box, I would recommend checking the spam box. And if you have questions, you can call our telephonic help desk, which is 1-833-VAX-COCO, which is 833, I think it's 829-2626. And yes. that, is, um, <laughs> that is a way that you can speak. I think the best time to call is Monday through 
Friday, eight to five and speak with a live person, they will tell you uh, whether uh, or not we have your name in the list. And um, if you're already over 75 and are eligible now, you can make an appointment directly with them at that time as well. Yeah, and if but someone if, from my staff wouldn't mind putting are, that number in the chat, that'd be awesome. I know yeah. that my office is on and that would be probably helpful. There we go already in they were ahead of me so that number please call that number and i i was told by the county that if you have any questions no matter how you signed up about appointments that's the number to call if you have questions about this is important i was told to convey this information doctors gailey if you have questions about the vaccine more broadly its efficacy anything like that besides appointments there's actually a different number you're supposed to call is that right doctors gailey it is there, but I don't have it in front of me. I'm okay. sorry, but we'll try to get it to you. <laughs> I think it's a general help desk, which is on our our website at the very top. Yeah, I think it's, yeah, it's the 844-729-8410. And we want to make sure that's happening because we want people to be able to move yeah. through the appointment processes um, efficiently as possible. And if we have too many people asking general questions, that'll bog down the appointment line. So appointment okay. line for appointments, the number yeah. that Dr. Sviali just gave and is now in the chat for general questions. And I do want to also point out if you are someone who can handle the computer and email, that is the preferred way. We don't want to get whole times really backed up by people um, calling. There's no better access on the phone versus on the email. So uh, submit your ticket, your interest form, and you'll get, you usually will get um, the, the ticket to schedule your appointment within one to two days if you're over 75. So uh, that process is working really well. I just saw that they opened another 6,000 6, appointments for next week, uh, just earlier today. So there should be tickets going on soon if you're still one of the people waiting. That's great. And I know one of the reasons people were frustrated they couldn't make an appointment immediately is, is supply, right? You got to make sure your appointments match your supply. So that is why there is a, there could be a delay, as I understand it. Exactly. You don't want people showing up for an appointment and there being no shots available. So, um, so that is why, but it is a good system that you know when you show up, you will get your vaccine. Um, Bob had a question. So he got the Pfizer shot already, his first shot. So happy for you, Bob. But he couldn't get his appointment for a second shot until five weeks after his first shot. Is that a problem? And can Not a get... problem. Okay. Not a problem. Yeah, the, F the FDA and CDC have said that any time past that three-week period for Pfizer or the four-week period for Moderna is fine. There's no time when that booster shot is too late. Uh, we know that uh, most of the effect happens after the first shot, most of the protection. And that second booster one, some people think it may even be more effective if you wait a little longer. So I feel um, very confident telling you it's not a problem. Three weeks, four weeks, five weeks, six weeks, not to worry. You, you'll be fine. Great. Thank you. So we got a question from someone who's concerned about their grandkids being out of school for this long. And I don't have your name, but I'm concerned about my kids being out of school this long. So I hear you. And Dr. Spiele, I think you have kids too. Are your kids old enough to be out of school? They are in both in high school girls and they're both at home all the time, really yeah. sick of me. So <laughs> so we, we understand exactly what it is you're concerned about. Um, so you're asking about the timeline for return and that is district dependent. I'll be frank with you. The state has worked really hard to create mechanisms to allow schools to reopen again. We've got $2 billion of funding we're gonna be voting on, which hopefully will assist with testing resources and PPE and, um, hazard pay for teachers if it's necessary. Um, and we are working hard on moving that, but it is a district by district specific decision about when and how they will go back. Um, but we are doing everything in our power to make sure that happens as soon as it is safe and that we've given them the resources for it to be possible. And I do wanna give a shout out to County Health. Obviously our superintendents and our school boards are not public health experts and the county has um, been a great partner to all of them in ensuring they have that expertise needed to to do what is safe for our children and know what is safe and what is not safe. So thank you, Dr. Svialli and your department for providing that to all of our schools. But we are doing our best. I hear you. And I want my kids back as soon as they can. 
Um, Todd asked about businesses. Um, what is the state doing to help businesses and restaurants in our area? I'm seeing a lot of closed establishments in Walnut Creek and now Neiman Marcus announced its permanent closing. Um, and I am with you. And I mentioned it a little bit in my brief overview, how concerned we are about businesses and small businesses specifically because they don't have um, the ability to take this much of a hit. Um, and so we are doing as much as we can. We've offered a number of grant and tax incentives to help struggling businesses. There's another um, grant that we are going to vote on that will be forthcoming in the next month or two. Um, but I, there is a grant period open right now. And I wanted to point that out. So the Cal Relief Grant is open and applications are available through February 2nd. And that is up to $25,000 um, in grant money. And so hopefully we can uh, get that to some of our local businesses. If you know anyone, please tell them to call my office. We can give them the information for that. Um, but again, huge shout out to our city that has done their part as well in helping to support those businesses. And hopefully now economic activity can get going a little bit again that we're in the purple tier. And also as our numbers go down, we'll hopefully see more activity and as we get more vaccinated. Um, so moving along to... Some more questions. I think we answered that one. Oh, somebody asked, what do we do need to do to increase the output and the amount of vaccines we're giving to people? I feel like we're not going fast enough. I know I feel the same way. I want one is it was available. I wanted everyone to be vaccinated immediately. Um, so, you know, part of it, and Drs. Valley can chime in as well, is supply. We just need more supply. And, you know, the county is very clear that they could double their their speed if they had the supply available. Um, so we are working on a couple things. One is transparency. We think that it's really critical. Both the federal government is giving us good numbers. We don't know how much is coming from the federal government in much, um, very far in advance. And the counties don't know what's coming from the state. And there's this, I think that piece of it we need to work on to ensure that the doses, there's transparency, the appointments can be made and you know what's coming, but we really just need to get more supply from the manufacturers. Anything to add, Dr. Skelly? Yeah, I think that's a supply. And I think uh, the federal administration now is trying, is evoked the War Powers Act and is trying to get more manufacturing of vaccine along. I will just give a shout out. Um, you know, the city of Walnut Creek was fantastic in getting us set up for that Tice Valley site over the weekend at very short notice. Uh, and everyone that we've worked with has really got this shared goal of vaccinating people as quickly as possible. You know, every elected representative, every city and county official, our board of supervisors, um, just it, it, we've just gotten yeses everywhere we've turned. So I just want to say this has been an incredible time for the community coming together and working together and everyone working towards that goal. I can tell you that the county health department is like, that is our mission. Our director, Anna Roth, has put out a, a, a ambitious thing to get a million doses into arms before July 4th. And, and we everyone is, is coming together and we're on track to make that happen. And I just feel really grateful to be part of this community. We are grateful to be here too. Um, so George from the Rossmore Trails Club asks a question near and dear to my heart. Um, I know COVID is important, but fighting climate change is also really critical for future generations. Are you still working on this issue while COVID is going on? Well, I, I preempted you and I talked about how I am because I could not agree more. Climate change is not stopping. And we wildfire prevention was one of our stated goals last year because we knew the wildfires weren't gonna stop just because we were in the middle of a global pandemic and they didn't. We had a horrible wildfire season. And so these, these issues need to continue to be top of mind for us as we work diligently with our local health officers to help you get through the pandemic. And so, as I mentioned, I'm introducing legislation focused on um, doing the research to know how these new distribution centers and the way we're moving goods is affecting air quality in our communities. Also, um, more clean energy. I'm working on a behind the meter effort to get us using more clean energy that we have at our fingertips instead of using our natural gas power plants or bringing in dirty energy from out of state. Um, also working on a few efforts focused on our clean vehicle future, which I'm really excited about. Um, and then just today was on a call focused on how to continue to preserve and protect open space in our community. So yes, to answer your question, I will not stop fighting climate change no matter what's going on around me, including a global pandemic, but it's um, just, 
all of these things are keeping me up at night now. So uh, let's see what else we've got. Um, oh, there was a question about aggregate data in Rossmore, Dr. Svielli. So one of the questions is, um, you know, folks in Rossmore are wondering, how do we know if people in our community are getting COVID, right? So there's data, I believe, on the county website about Walnut Creek, but not specific to Rossmore, which is so big. Is there a way to get that data so they know? Um, there probably is. Uh, I think I saw that our data team was working on something like that, and I will take it back to them, see if they have that completed and uh, share that if we can. Okay. I don't and know if it will be perfect. I think they do it by the zip code. So it might be a little more than just Rossmore, but uh, they'll, they'll, they get, they can get pretty close. We have incredible data people. That would be great. And I know that if we get that to Tim, he's, he's, I'm sure I'll speak for him and say, he'd probably be happy to get it to the community since they want to know. Um, Art asks, before one gets the vaccine, is there anything that they should do prior to the shot? Discontinue aspirin or any change in regimen? No, I wouldn't change any of your medicine. Um, you know, the, the first shot often gives you a sore arm. So if you're a side sleeper and you sleep on one side, I recommend getting it on the other side. Um, sometimes with the first, but more often with the second, people will get a little bit of a flu-like symptom. I just had my second shot and I felt like a little sick for a couple of days, like a low grade fever, muscle aches, joint pains, headaches. And that's really common now uh, with the second shot. We're seeing that a lot. So I just would not make a lot of plans for those uh, couple of days after the second sh shot. Just be ready to be home and rest and uh, recover. And uh, it's a good sign. It means your immune system is doing what it's supposed to do to make the antibodies and T cells and all the things it's supposed to do to uh, combat the virus. Well, it's good to know that when we don't feel good, it's a good thing, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so I know there was a question and I don't know where it was about the order of vaccinations for those under 65. Um, and I can try to answer that and Dr. Svela, you can correct me if I'm wrong. There was a shift just this week. Um, so for those who are 65 and older, you are obviously in the priority now, 75 and up now, and then 65 and up. And then there are some essential workers who we've continued to prioritize. So anyone in the food chain, um, our teachers and others, a few other childcare providers, essential workers. And then the announcement was that we would go to a purely age-based um, system. So for those of you that are uh, 55 to 65, I imagine you will come next. But Dr. Sfiali, is that your understanding? Yes, yeah, so I think that well, that's exactly right. Yeah, the, the, a few essential sectors after we are done with the 65 and up. And, and uh, then after those essential sectors, just purely age-based. And it's sort of like boarding an airplane. So uh, like right now, we're still getting some healthcare workers that maybe didn't get them when their turn came. So if you're uh, someone who's a late adopter, you want to see a little more data before you trust it. Uh, you'll be able to come in later if you're over 65, um, even when we go do those other tiers. So we just got a question on that exact point. So Sharon asked, what are we doing for those folks who are hesitant? It's obviously important we get to herd immunity, so we want everyone to yeah. join this effort. Yeah, that's a really great question. We, you know, there's a lot of reasons people are hesitant. Some people are hesitant just because they like to see more data, they're late adopters, and I think that that piece will naturally get better because we have a lot of studies happening and more and more data on safety and efficacy will come out. Other people are distressful because of historical shortcomings that we in the medical community have had, especially the African-American community, sometimes the Latinx community there. And so we are working on vaccine messaging for them or doing a specific outreach to those communities. Uh, we call that vaccine hesitancy, and we uh, we know we have a lot of work to do as as public health professionals to try to get that message across. That's one of our biggest challenges, and I do think uh, if you look at the studies, the numbers are getting better. I think a few months ago, only half the people said they would accept the vaccine. Right now, the latest one I saw was 71%. Um, so I think we're, we're trending in the right direction. There's still more work to do, especially with some of um, the traditionally underrepresented populations. 
Yeah. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Sfiele, for being here, for answering so many of our questions and for all the work you do to get us all through this pandemic and keep us healthy during pandemic times and non-pandemic times, although you weren't quite the celebrity you are now before this pandemic. So um, thank you for being our partner throughout this. I can't believe it's been a year, but I, I am hopeful that we are getting to the other side of this, both because of our declining numbers, um, but also because of the rate at which you're vaccinating everyone. So thank you so much for your efforts and for everything you've do, done, for being here to provide such valuable information. Um, I'm just so grateful. So I also wanna thank Vice Mayor um, Francois for being here, for everything he and the council continue to do for the city of Walnut Creek during these very difficult times. This is not an easy time to be a public servant. And we are so grateful to you and your colleagues for everything you're doing to keep the city running smoothly during what I know are such difficult times. And I, I appreciate being your partner in that. And of course, Tim, for everything you do for all of the Ross Morians. Um, again, I can't wait to be back at Rossmore in person for cocktails with all of you at Creekside and all the fun that we've had over the years. And I know we will get back there. So let's just stay strong, continue to wear our masks, stay socially distant, do the things that our health officers are asking us to do to keep this community safe, to save lives, to get our children back in school and to get through this pandemic. Just a quick reminder that my office is always here to support you and answer any questions you may have. I know we didn't get to all the questions. So if we didn't and you have a burning question, please feel free to call and we're happy to answer it um, live. We answer our phones. My staff is distant right now. They are working from home, but we answer our phones as per usual, nine to five, five days a week. And you can reach us at 925-328-1515. So thank you all for coming. Stay safe, be well, and be in touch.